ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning. So artificial intelligence has, uh, has been part of our daily lives for many years now. Uh, it is used by the maps when giving us new predictions, by the online search engines, answering our <coughs> questions, and it is the algorithm feeding us targeted content on our social media platforms. We only perhaps started, started calling AI AI in our casual conversations when ChatGPT appeared almost a year ago and stunned us with its ability to produce human-like text when it blew our minds with its ability to create. From deep learning came the foundation models powering generative AI applications, models of artificial networks inspired by the billions of neurons connected in the human brain. They process extremely large and diverse sets of unstructured data to perform their tasks. The latest studies suggest that generative AI could raise global GDP by 7%, and that's a significant effect for any single technology, which industry could see the best or the biggest impact as a percentage of their revenue start coming from generative AI. Can this revolutionary technology empower us amid persistent economic headwinds to tackle our most pressing challenges? How do we balance creativity and control? I personally feel that the generative AI discussion couldn't be more exciting and disturbing at the same time. And I honestly feel a bit schizophrenic when I get all hyped up reading about protein engineering through language, large language models and how it could one day end the suffering of cancer and Alzheimer patients. But then I find quite unsettling everything. I read about black boxes, hallucinations, emergent properties, and of course the unintended consequences of generative AI to become <coughs> terrified reading that GPT-4 shows sparks of human intelligence. With all this, how do we make sure we are enhancing our humanity, not losing it? I am sure you all want to hear what mm -hmm. our panelists have to say about all of this today. I am honored to be joined by um, Mary Cummings, the director of Mason Autonomy and Robotics Center at George Mason University, uh, Pascal Fung, uh, chair professor in the Department of Electronic and Computer Engineering at Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, Jay Lee Clark, distinguished professor and director of the Industrial AI Center at the University of Maryland, and Jeremy Jerkins, the managing director at the World Economic Forum. If you choose to share insights from this session, please use the hashtag AMGFC23. And let me start with you, uh, Missy. So we have all these promises of adding value and growth to the, eco uh, to the uh, global economy. Are we talking about making our industries, our sectors better, or about even creating whole new <coughs> industries? I think that AI can make some industries better, for sure. I mean, we've already seen it. I do think that we're going to see a lot of new jobs created, and I think it's hard for us. You know, you hear the mantra over and over again that jobs are going to be taken away. Uh, people, you're not going to need journalists anymore. And, um, you know, it, it may be true that generative AI can potentially replace small amounts of jobs, but if you really know how this technology works, one of the issues of generative AI is it regresses to the mean. It's always giving you the average response. And so if you ever look at any text generated by uh, any of the large language models, what you find is it's actually quite boring. It's very predictable. It's very average, right? So. I, as a professor, I don't worry about AI at all. I encourage my students to use it, go for it, because generative AI produces like B, C level work. Mm -hmm. It's not innovative, it's not creative, and so I think what generative AI is actually going to do is it's going to make us better. Do you think we're gonna have new industries? Oh, absolutely. Uh, there will be, a whole, I call it the crime scene investigators division. Uh, if, you, if you're a company and you put ChatGPT or any of the other large language models into your company, you're gonna have to hire a whole division of people to correct it. 
That's interesting. Um, so, Jeremy, uh, let's talk about uh, real-life examples now of sectors that have actually started benefiting and unlocking uh, value by adopting generative AI. What comes to mind? Sure. Let me give you a positive example here again, building on uh, Mrs. example. You know, we often think of uh, AI as displacing labor, and that's ultimately a choice, whether we use it for automation or augmentation. And so, in you know, a lot of the developed countries, it's natural to think of you know, labor shortages, okay, how do we get more efficiency, how do we displace labor? But if we look in emerging markets, and we've seen really positive examples, for example, in India, here we're actually using AI and agriculture to augment the labor there, right? You're not actually going to replace the worker on the farm. And we recently ran pilots in the state of Telangana, uh, 7,000 chili farmers, where we looked at, say, okay, how do we use digital technologies, including AI, to improve the utilization of water, uh, reduce the usage of pesticides, uh, improve time to market, and uh, increase the yields on the food production. And what we saw is that we could actually generate um, around 15% uh, improvement in yield, uh, improvements in profitability, at around $700 per hectare. Now, if you take into account that uh, roughly 50% of the Indian population is in agriculture today, slightly over, and 85% of their smallholder farmers with just only a hectare or two, making a $700 increase in your yield that you get from that hectare with these digital tools is absolutely huge. It will help contribute to what you said, you know, that's kind of 7% growth in the economy. So it's up to us, it's a choice whether we use it for uh, augmentation or automation, uh, automation. And I think my bias is we'll see a lot of use cases that we use it to augment human labor, human capabilities, and that's what will help drive those uh, improvements. What other sectors do you see growth coming mainly from in the short term? I mean, you mentioned agriculture. What other uh, industries? Yeah, another one I think I'll again pull from the developed markets example is in healthcare. All right, we have these debates around, okay, is the AI radiologist better than the human radiologist? You know, is it 95% accuracy, 97% accuracy? But if you're in a country like Rwanda, where you have, you know, a dozen radiologies for a population of over 10 million people, it's not a choice between the human radiologist or an AI radiologist. It's a choice between none or the AI. And then it's quite clear I'll take the AI radiologist, whether it's at 95% or 97%, and actually bring that in. And so I think that's, again, another positive example of the dissemination of these technologies. And then they benefit by increased uh, connectivity, uh, increased uh, utilization of digital devices. And so I see a really positive effect here. Jay, when you, when you hear about these examples, you get the feeling that AI, generative AI, is there and ready, filling all the gaps, being able to do everything. Does that apply to industry, or are there still gaps that need to be filled? Well, certainly, I mean, uh, AI is not just generative AI, right? So certainly it's uh, one new trend from the text and images and language model. But the industry, we're talking about large knowledge model, not just large language model, which means we have a historic data, lots of data. We got machine data, sensor data, humans, you know, judgment data, and also model simulation data. Those are the critical. So industry, we're talking about three W. Work reduction, reduce a lot of redundant work. For example, if I repeat work, well, why repeat? One time finished, right? Second, waste reduction. Well, all industry want to continuously remove the waste, emission, better emission, better carbon footprints, eventually you have carbon free, right? That's what it is. Third, worry reduction. We talk about industry, a lot of work, a lot of worries, people worry, you have an alarm, you have a downtime, you have an accident. Those worries can be predicted, can be prevented. That's why you have a better, even like manufacturing industry, you wanna attract younger workforce coming in, you better make the systems very, very exciting, not just a dark, boring danger, right? So you want to make him, the workplace is more fun, more exciting, and more systematic. Yeah. But you will essentially yeah. need more specific models. Well, domain-driven model, mm -hmm. not just open source data. Mm -hmm. But industry, domain source, not shareable sometimes. Of course, often, semiconductor, no way, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Not shareable. So you've got to build the vertical, domain vertical, 
AI. Just improve the localized efficiency, quality, and safety. Yeah. Pascal, in the longer view, what do you see AI uh, contributing when it comes to the more complex uh, human challenges and problems? Yeah, so I think uh, it's necessary for me to spend a little bit of time explaining the fundamental difference from, uh, between the generative AI models we're seeing today yeah. and the future. Yes, we will continue to have domain-specific, industry-specific, uh, context-specific uh, applications, uh, AI tools, but the fundamental difference is this. Uh, people always think that ChatGPT or GPT-4 can do everything. We actually have no understanding of what's the limit of what they can do and also the limit of their cap capabilities, the, the, the mistakes they can make. However, they are uh, what we call general learners. What's important to understand about these models is that they can learn everything under the sun from the tax, tax data, from audio, from image. So there are multi-model uh, large models coming up that they will learn everything. And then they will be embodied also in robots so they can learn from the physical world. So these are general learning models. They can learn everything from us. Um, so once they've learned all this, the future of AI, sorry, I'm uh, being a bit like a lecturer, but the future of AI is that we're gonna make downstream AI models, classifiers and, and, and generators or uh, creative tools, they can be very creative, downstream from these foundational models, all right? And then we need to have safety measures and so on in, into this. So uh, to solve complex problems, so they have the amazing ability, uh, ability. As scientists, before you have a scientific theory, you need to have hypothesis. You need to explore the different possibilities. For example, for drug discovery, for cancer treatment, um, you need to have the hypothesis space, uh, exploration of such space. And these models can do a much more scalable job than a single scientist or a number of scientists. So that's how they're gonna help us solve complex problems. Mm -hmm. They can help us with the exploration. They can help us with the learning from all the data and from multimodal data mm -hmm. in the world. Missy, do leaders in the business community understand the technology as is being put by uh, Pascal? Do they understand what it is about, what AI is, and how is this affecting adoption? So I think the biggest threat to national security in the United States is the technical illiteracy that is happening uh, about AI, which is much bigger than generative AI. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, people think that they hear AI and they immediately think chat GPT. I, I want to be really clear, and I'm going to be like Pascal and take on the professorial tone, mm -hmm. but a little contrary to Pascal. Generative AI knows nothing. It does not know right from wrong. It does not know truth from a lie. It only knows what's in the data set. And if the data set is corrupted, then it knows corrupted things. The vertical AI is, I think, perhaps the best implementation because you narrowly constrain it. And I worry, and I lecture around the world, that companies who buy into the hype of generative AI are putting themselves at real risk. And if you have a software company that doesn't touch a safety critical system, then fine. But what I see is generative AI and versions of general generative AI showing up in safety critical systems. And this is a real risk. Uh, people will die. Self-driving cars are making mistakes that end up in injuries. Um, pseudo self-driving cars like Tesla's that with a lot of AI in them are killing people. So we need to make sure, at, and I think I, it starts with the C-suite. The C-suite needs to stop with what I call the world word salad. I don't, do not put blockchain, digital twin, and AI into the same sentence because it tells me that you don't know what you're talking about. So I, what I would implore people is to make sure you surround yourselves with people who really know what AI is so that you can leverage the real benefits without putting your company at risk. Let me take this to Jeremy and about uh, uh, forward-thinking uh, leaders. Uh, do you need strong leadership in order to transition into the AI world, into, in order to transform your business? What do strong leaders need to rethink? 
Yeah, I think uh, we definitely need leaders to actually understand the fundamentals. And I agree with Missy here that there's a lot of uh, misunderstandings what happens. So, you know, people look at this, they say, okay, let's just roll out chat GPT, right? And if you come back to the example, and I think I'm biased along with uh, Jay Lee here, I think we'll end up with a number of uh, vertically specialized models. And if we come back to the health example from earlier, um, I don't necessarily want to get my health AI data from TikTok yeah. and Reddit <laughs> and X uh, versus <laughs> if I build a maybe a small language model, which can still be quite large with all of the data we have from sensors, from you know, uh, doctor's reports, et cetera, we can still have massive amount of data, use generative AI uh, techniques to apply it within a specific domain and then get improved healthcare, eventually personalized medicine, but it'll need to be done with uh, intention. It'll need to be done with uh, understanding of the trade-offs. And here I think this is where the role of dialogue is important. And sometimes you can actually, uh, you know, you move slowly to move smoothly and you move smoothly to move fast. And if you just rush into, okay, let's roll out these models because everybody else is, you actually do introduce these risks in. So I think it does require deliberate leadership, conscious understanding of both the opportunities and the goals that we want to pursue, but as well some of the risks that come with it. Pascal, when we talk about um, enhancing productivity, are we also talking about changing workflows within an organization, uh, changing values within an organization? So coming back to this misunderstanding of generative models again, um, so, maybe, you know, it's very important to understand that these models are general learners. So, yeah. we use them to learn about general human capabilities that, so for example, the ability to uh, do logical thinking, reasoning, the ability to plan, the ability of uh, multiple languages. These are the abilities that we learn, common sense and so on. There are benchmarking papers that we publish to measure these uh, abilities of these models. So what you want to use them in industry is that uh, you have to first of all understand whether in your application you need any such human abilities. You don't need ChatGPT if you are doing uh, safety, uh, some kind of a classification of, uh, you know, I don't know, downtime or something. Mm. You don't need that human like uh, common sense, mm. right? When you don't need that, don't use it because then it also has a, a possibility of hallucinating things that you don't want. But if you really need human capabilities, you start with these models and then you fine tune with your applications with human in the loop. So even with these models, there's human, um, you know, RHF is human in the loop. It's by no means perfect, so the models are not perfect. So with that, being mindful of its pitfalls, when you're using your, your, your company's uh, workflow, you need to understand where I need such abilities, where I don't need it. Maybe customer uh, service, I need a chatbot, then I will use these models and I need to fine tune it. So make sure it's safe, make sure this is exactly what I want um, and that uh, this will follow uh, uh, the company um, scenarios. Uh, if you don't need, it's not, if you, you don't need that, you're doing some kind of analysis, you might not need foundational models. So it is important to have this, uh, what, what you guys call the AI literacy, to, to know what to use and what not to use. Jay, would you say that it, it, it would really depend on how much the, the technology is purpose-driven uh, and that will determine the, the sort of return on investment you make uh, in uh, adopting AI? Yeah, I mean, we in general in industry or in many sectors, right, we have, a, I call the 3P issue, problems, processes and purpose, right? Engineer love problems, right? Yeah. And then, but management love processes, <laughs> SOP, SOP. But customer care about purpose, right? Yeah. Value, yes. evidence. So from that perspective, when you make a product, you want to provide the evidence to customers. Oh, I do save you energy. See, this is the evidence. It's not about the assumption, about the improvements, evidence. So people buy evidence by purpose, right? So eventually you want to embed those good methods, good practices. Could be machine learning, could be a good model. But if the system is very complicated, what well, we can use a surrogate model, like a response service approximation, to measure the large inputs versus a describable output. 
There are many methods can be used, right? So I call the metrology system. How do you measure the evidence so customer willing to pay? That's very important. That's the baseline. So another thing we have to understand the industry, in many ways, we have to understand the baseline and bottom line. Baseline is what are you comparing with? It's not the open space intelligence. The baseline is here. Then your bottom line, if I invest X dollar, a number of people, how much I got out of it? Can, this, can you sustain that bottom line? Only, only one time. So AI is not always intelligent, has to be actual implementation. Mm. Yeah. So yeah. You, you spoke about the knowledge-based systems for industry, and then there are the general models that make a lot of mistakes or hallucinate. Do you see them talking to one another yeah. one day in, in a factory? Yeah, yeah, I would say, you know, generally AI is a new way of using a large open resources. Like Missy was saying, the data quality is in question, in question and you cannot use those to do the actual things, right? But industry, but people, the, the, those data, they're controlled by the company. Energy data, semiconductor data, even the many machinery data. So we will cherry and pick and label the data in such a way the data are useful and usable. The a lot of industry data is useful, but sometimes not usable. But you are not, you know, you do not have a, you do not have a label, the good background, you have no baseline attached to it, right? So I would say generative AI can also add the user element in there. For example, I have workers, I want to do fast training. Ah, instead of you yeah, teach you one one to one, right? I can oh, you can self learn system in general space, and of course domain specific space it takes time, but general space I can skip very quickly. So for for that point, uh, customer service like you described, which is a good tool, right? Mm. And right now, if you call many, many airlines, sometimes if flight got canceled, very hard to reach people, right? So somehow, that should be improved the customer service aspect. Yeah. Missy, do you feel sometimes that we're putting too much hope on a technology that is still being developed? And, and does that sort of put pressure for releasing a new uh, technology that perhaps did not really mature enough? Yeah, I heard you say at the beginning that you were both excited and terrified with generative AI. And I thought to myself, oh, I'm just exhausted with it. Uh, uh, it's the latest and greatest new tool. So this is not my first time with World Economic Forum. Uh, Pascal and I were many years ago on the Robotics and AI Council. And this was like 2017. And this is, we were on the robotics and AI talking about, we were talking about the wave of AI that was going to come. And one of the messages um, that I delivered personally to Klaus was there's too much hype. It's yeah. going out of control. And here we are seven years later. And I'm actually thinking about moving to a desert island because I can't get away from it, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's a tool in a toolbox. It is not the only tool, as the other speakers have said. You know, there, there are, you need to know when is the right time to apply it and when it's not the right time to apply it. But I'm very, very concerned that people are starting to commit large resources. And this is particularly bad in the United mm -hmm. States. Is, you know, we're going to commit large resources to developing potentially generative AI models that are incredibly brittle. The United States is looking into whether or not we can replace research scientists with generative AI. It's insane. It's not ever going to happen, at least not with the tools that we have right now, but they're thinking about committing hundreds of millions of dollars into trying to make this happen. This is a mistake. We need to augment humans with generative AI. If we go down this path of trying to make research, independent research scientists with artificial intelligence in the form of generative AI, I can assure you that would be the end of the United States being world leaders in this space. That's a very strong message. So, uh, Pascal, and I mean, yeah, we, I started talking about AI when I felt that I had an assistant uh, uh, I could ask mm. questions to, and then, realized that it was sometimes very confidently giving me totally wrong answers. Now, I understand you call that hallucinations. Are these solvable problems? 
what is the story of not being able to reverse engineer an output that is coming from, from a system of generative AI? What do, the, what do all these problems tell us, Pascal, and are they being solved? Yeah, so first of all, um, I do remember our discussions in C seven years ago. But I also want to say that uh, me, along with uh, many scientists in AI, AI scientists, I had this recent um, exchange with Joshua Bengu. We, today we say that we never imagined this day will come in our lifetime. This time is different. I'm sorry to be the bearer of good news and bad news. Mm -hmm. This time it is different. For us uh, who have been in AI in this line of research for 30 years and more, uh, these models uh, are reaching a point um, that uh, we are very concerned about its uh, safety having a real, you know, real impact in the, in the world, including hallucination. Um, so coming back to hallucination, so the term came from the computer vision area where people saw the generative image models. Let's not forget, there's not just the ChatGPT, the text yeah. models. There's also the image models. Actually, as a um, uh, uh, visiting professor at the Central Academy of Fine Art in Beijing, I teach artists and uh, design students to use these models. They actually uh, are very good at being creative. That's why they're called generative AI models. They create things that have not been seen in a database. Um, so in, initially, you know, if you use these image models, a mid-journey, stable diffusion, and so on, it will create images sometimes at the beginning, like in, in the original, uh, many years ago, seems like a lifetime ago, when you have um, um, image models that would generate like cats and dogs in the sky. It looks very much like human visual hallucination. So that's where the term came from, uh, computer image hallucination, because it looked really like human hallucination. So today we use that term to describe in general the same phenomenon of creativity of these models. But when it creates something we don't want, we call that hallucination. So for example, non-factual answers, um, 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 undesirable toxic uh, content, discriminatory content, we classify all these things, undesirable creativity, under the term of hallucination. And there are active, uh, there is a, it, it is an active research area in the field uh, a, lot of, a lot of researchers are working on mitigating, identifying hallucination and mitigating hallucination. The difficulty of identifying a hallucination is that it's exactly the same as uh, creativity. So it has the same confidence because not just it sounds confident, but that internally the model itself does not have an uncertainty measure against things that are not true. Because that's how the model came about. It was supposed to generate things that was not seen in the database. So it doesn't know. So what we are doing today is to actually link these models, uh, ground, we we'll call them grounding, ground these models in large knowledge base. So don't give me the answer like this, you know, do you check first, mm -hmm. okay? We're incorporating knowledge base, uh, knowledge sources, structure and unstructured knowledge sources into the training process into the uh, decoding process, and also by mitigating the fine-tuning database. So the general database has already been trained. Now when we fine-tune, meaning we retrain it with curated database, that's factual. And there are really uh, new approaches, for example, one that's been proposed by uh, Yang Lecun, Meta, is uh, an approach to incorporate um, uh, this kind of uh, um, self-reflective uh, reasoning to say, hey, am I telling the truth here, in the uh, inference process. So when it's generating answers, it's supposed to uh, check itself. Mm -hmm. So there are new research coming out and, and will come um, in, the, uh, in, in the coming years for us to solve this problem. I think we can solve this problem in different ways, whether we're combining these models with another model or we are making this model <laughs> self-reflective. Those are different approaches. I believe we can solve this problem. But it's a bit worrying that we're solving problems of systems yes. that are already yes. there and yes. working. They're not in labs. Yes. So we also think that people need to have. We need to have a general framework of uh, um, governing the regulating the outcome. Mm. So the outcome, how you use the system in the financial domain, in the medical domain, in the health domain, should be subjected in the legal domains should be subjected to the existing regulations in these industries already. 
So you should not, as a lawyer, be using ChatGPT to come up with you know, previous cases. That's violating, actually, the legal profession's uh, own regulation, right? Mm -hmm. So humans should not be using these models thinking uh, to treat them as another human being. Mm -hmm. They're machines. You use them as tools. So just like any other tool, you cannot just take its output for granted. You curate it, you look at it, you verify it. Mm -hmm. So that's the usage that we need to regulate. Jeremy, speaking of uh, toxicity, which uh, Pascal mentioned here, uh, the social media story and all the unintended consequences of what seemed like an innocent like or targeted uh, feed. Have we lost control there, first of all? And what have we learned? And how did we change things accordingly? Yeah, so I, I don't believe that We've collectively lost control. Mm. Um, I think it's important that we don't overly anthropomorphize uh, AI. Uh, we retain agency. I think what we've done is we've delegated to algorithms things that probably shouldn't have been delegated, right? And so I think this is really important to just remember that we do have agency, that these are decisions that we take around when we use the tools, when we don't. And this is one of the reasons the World Economic Forum is established in uh, AI Governance Alliance, which uh, Missy's also uh, joined me on. We have a number of the large technology companies that are at the forefront of using these models. We have some of the new com companies that are challenging the incumbents. Uh, we have regulators coming in. And I think to borrow from the alliterative frameworks of uh, Professor Jay Lee, we think about the three Gs. One, the guardrails that Pascal's uh, discussing there. It is important to discuss, you know, when should we not be using uh, these technologies? We need to understand them better. Uh, mission critical functions, things that are around life and death. What is the governance that we need around these models? Um, how does that play out in different contexts? Again, the model I want in a manufacturing floor or in a delivery system will be different than in healthcare or a nuclear power plant. And then what are the guidelines that we can propose uh, for companies and institutions on how to think about these things. Mm -hmm. So I think this kind of you know, guardrails, governance, mm -hmm. guidelines, mm -hmm. it's an important uh, way to consider that. And then if you have this framework, then depending on the use case, depending on the purpose and the intent, mm -hmm. you can look at. But I think within that, again, it's important to retain agency, to be conscious of that, and not just assume that there's uh, some autonomous system out there that's doing this, right? We're still uh, responsible for what we put in place. Jay, speaking of life and death, is it a kind of an evolution? Will some systems just die and others live? You mean human or...? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully no, <laughs> AI. <laughs> well, I would say if you look at the uh, certain thing, right, in many industrial space, we human beings have a great knowledge, but also we have uh, many areas we're not incapable to do the time window, when you're in the very fast things, we're not good at it, we have emotion involved, right? So certain things, for example, in certain things, you want to make decision for certain, we are limited by what we see, what we know, and what is the emotional influence. But the augmentation from the AI system can help you look at different type of priority, rationale, and the risks. I think that is a good tool. I mean, let's use an example of an ICU in hospital. We work in ICU AI, right? Today, if people in ICU, people die every day there, unfortunately, right? You have a great equipment, all connected, right? You have a ventilator, all the uh, posts and everything. No intelligence. Everyone's waiting for alarm to happen. Alarm happened, nurse run into it, right? That's what happened. You know, so, so eventually, like brain, you have traumatic injury, TBI we call. There are a lot of risks we cannot see. A nurse only waited for an alarm to happen. So you can really see what is a transient risk is coming. Help to prioritize the time. If you have a 26 patient, you equally spend 26. No, pay attention to those high risk patients first. <laughs> Right. Let's see, is this that save lives? Yeah. Is this is this when we talk about feeding uh, yeah. AI systems, um, mental human models, and, and and doing as much of that as possible? Well, it kind of goes back to what Pascal said. The, the real success of these systems 
are not going to be just a generative AI model. Yes. It will yes. be a generative AI model plus model-based sure. AI sure. plus oh, combining with GoFi, good old-fashioned AI, right? So um, I think that we need to move away from, I feel like people desperately want some magic in their lives yeah. and somehow generative AI has, it, there's got some magic to it and I think we love to have magic, right? right? But the sad part about this is generative AI is kind of like that really bad old fashioned Las Vegas magician. You know, they've got a couple of good tricks, but it's really not that hard to, to see um, how, they're, how they're doing the trick, right? And so I, I would like us to kind of back away from the religious fervor of AI and the magic of AI to really start looking at the hard issues, mm -hmm. which are the real engineering of AI, yes. how to make them safe, the hallucination problem. Mm -hmm. If you think it's bad for text-based AI, mm -hmm. all self-driving cars, Teslas, plus all real mm -hmm. self-driving cars have hallucinations in for mm -hmm. real. They see things that are not there and they slam on their brakes and this has led to mm. countless accidents <laughs> and some deaths, right? So I hope that we really concentrate on, the, on getting our hands dirty in the AI to try to make it work and to make it work, we're gonna have to build yep. an infrastructure mm. around it. Yep. So in that sense, to what extent do you think regulations um, should be focused on the actual engineering rather than the national considerations or national priorities? I have to tell you, the United States is so bipolar right now. Um, I recently finished a year with the Biden administration helping them do regulation for self-driving cars. And it's just the technology we refuse to regulate. So despite the fact that there's been a lot of deaths and lots of problems, um, we're not going to regulate self-driving cars. Okay, then like half a mile over in DC is everyone trying to ban large language models in ChatGPT. And as a scientist, it drives me insane because the technology they want to ban for large language models is the same as what's in the cars. Mm -hmm. And I've said that more than once the administration. You know, if you ban it over here, you're gonna have to ban it over there. It's the same. And this, you know, this is one of the reasons why I run around screaming that, you know, everyone's an idiot. You need to go back to school and learn about what, what these technologies are. Because, you know, and this, if, we, if you, you cannot just start making sweeping grand regulation, yeah. it's gonna have to be in the verticals. You have to regulate self-driving cars, you have to, separately from medical devices, mm -hmm. yes. separately from financial industries, mm -hmm. right? Because the application is, you cannot get away from the fact that it's data specific. And so instead of trying to have grand regulations yes. and sweeping mm -hmm. policies, we need to look at this each in yeah. an individual case. Pascal, how does it affect the rolling out of technologies when we speak about different geographies? with different regulations, say, um, in the East, in Europe, in the US, and then you talk about one company that is operating in all of these uh, uh, spaces. So today, the reality is that um, every jurisdiction has different um, regulatory framework on AI and technology, the use, um, and privacy, and so on. It's some of it. You know, EU can be more stringent on some yeah. aspects, and China is more stringent on other aspects, and so on. So, um, uh, for, for I think all the global companies operating in these different jurisdictions, they have to comply with all of them, mm. right? So, um, so that that's a challenge for, for for global companies. However, I think there is something that's really important to all the all the countries and all people. And, uh, um, and I think it is time we start talk talking about an international treaty on AI safety. Um, if we have learned any lessons, so I was, uh, as I mentioned, I, I met with the uh, grandson of Robert Oppenheimer last week in yeah. Geneva. There's this Oppenheimer project, and they asked this question, what lessons have we learned from the Manhattan Project? So what we have today is that every major country has a Manhattan Project on AI. Mm -hmm. And uh, nobody knows what the other is building, mm -hmm. and everybody's scared, right, about the red lines. 
So why don't we get together uh, between nations to talk about the red lines that we all do not want to cross? For example, uh, Missy earlier <coughs> mentioned that putting AI in uh, operation of nuclear weapons, uh, as an example. For example, the uh, rights of humans should precede that of any machine, no matter how human-like they, they become in the future. So, and, and other things, right? So I think this is time, uh, not only we have all these uh, in, you know, multi-stakeholder, multinational discussions on AI regulations, but also really precisely on the red lines we should not cross, mm -hmm. in the, now and in the future. Mm -hmm. Because again, um, it is not hype. Uh, this is a new era of AI from these models because they are universal learners. We did not build them to learn A, B, and C. They learn everything on their own with a very simple objective function of autoregressive uh, self-learning. So what this is the- What are the red lines for you, Pascal? The red lines for me, so uh, one of it, which is that the human rights should always superset of machine, no matter what happened. Any conflict will come between uh, hum an anonymous human being to a super intelligent machine that's superhuman like that human should always have more rights. And also I'm concerned that we should not build AI or use AI in any fashion that will violate the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which all these countries have already signed on to. So non-discrimination, um, uh, equity, inclusivity, uh, human dignity, respecting human dignity, and so on. Jeremy, the European AI Act that is going to be enforced end of this year, how significant is this on, on this path? Uh, you have to be careful commenting on these elements. Uh, if you look at the regulation, it was actually developed before the current trend there, so I think it'll still require some adaptation to the current uh, environment and the new technologies. I think if we go back this uh, 2017 kind of seminal paper, you know, attention is all you need uh, from some of the Google researchers that actually drove uh, this kind of transformer framework, still relatively new. Um, what I do see is us moving needing to move towards actually policies and regulations that understand the risks rather than trying to regulate the technology or the use cases, actually that's trying to regulate for the risks. And within this, you know, we sometimes feel like we're torn between this, uh, you know, uh, surveillance capitalism <coughs> or surveillance corporatism, you know, however it might be, and the state. Uh, actually, if we start looking at policies that put citizens first, and you talked about the human, you know, human aspect there, and I do see, you know, positive examples of that. You know, if I think if we look at some of the work that's been done around digital public goods in India, for example, they have a baseline of digital identity with the Aadhaar program there. They have their UPI program in uh, financial services. They're now developing regulations for technology stacks in healthcare and agriculture. Designed, again, with intent, you can have public goods that emerge from these capabilities. You can create entrepreneurial ecosystems that different players can plug in, and you can actually expand the market that also the incumbent and traditional players can benefit from uh, services. But these require dialogue, mm. they require interaction, and I think the most important thing we can do yes. is continue the discussions mm. to share and exchange mm. and avoid that we think there's any single solution mm. in place or that there's a software solution to all these, but rather discuss it uh, to yeah. develop the uh, policies and regulations there. Whenever we have a session about AI, generative AI, any type of AI, and we have one more question left, it has to be about general intelligence, uh, general artificial intelligence. So, uh, Jay, um, is, it, is it wrong to think that the uh, development in generative AI has pushed up considerably the timeline to uh, artificial general intelligence? Well, no. Yes or no, because in some unknown space that can help us improve the knowledge acquisition, improve the extent, to extent what we don't know, right? The learning system, which is good. But for a, a, a opportunity space, for example, we, we have many, many things in industry. We need more efficiency, more uh, a carbon-free environment. We need to apply good method, doesn't matter if it's AI or whatever, but if I do use AI, well, I want to make sure we have a more precision things. But in general, AI I give you many possibilities. But industry, we're looking for precision, a different culture, yeah. <laughs> right? 
So when I talk about possibility, precision, 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 precision semiconductor, seven, five, seven nano, five nano, three nano, two, two nano, right? For uh, aerospace, you have a much fuel efficiency and better, you know, the safety, all the precision, precision. So I think the future, we need to look at the, how we make the data quality better. Yeah. And trustworthiness is very important. Certain area you're talking about the, beside the uh, uh, red line area, but you need also understand gray line area, <laughs> right? The news, fake news. If I keep feeding you the fake news, you train the model, they can be fake plus fake, right? Fake plus. But in a critical sensitive time frame, in some election, oh, that's big bad things to happen. So that's why I'm saying how you def have a good method to have a AI trustworthiness of that the, the things, right? Yeah. Pascal, from the very specific to the very general, would general artificial intelligence be a challenge to our humanity, to our own existence? Um, it's challenging our existence right now, isn't it? Um, I talked to uh, artists. Uh, I talk to, uh, actually I'm going to talk to artists next week in Milan again. I talk to um, scientists even, and um, I talk to um, policy makers, uh, writers, so on. And every time I talk to people, they feel that these tools are doing something that they, used to, they are used to doing. So it's already a challenge. But is challenge bad? I think the challenge we are facing today is pushing us to ask the question, the question of us. Who are we? What are humans? What's our humanity? And uh, I have talked to people, and I, this is how I explain uh, where we're going to go with AI. AI will become more and more powerful, and it's going to be multimodal, it's going to be embodied, it's going to be in robots. You will see robots in a few years that will go around learning on its own uh, physical tasks. Right? including intellectual tasks. So these machines will be able to do not just the stuff that we are doing physically, that's, that we are used to, right? They can fly higher than us, they can run faster, but they are going to be thinking better than humans. The thinking, so the, the term thinking has been a uh, threat to a lot of people. What are human beings but thinking machines? Are we just thinking machines though? Humans are not just thinking machines. We're not just the ones who produce PowerPoints or write uh, 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 analyst reports or even somebody who produces algorithms because today we're using generative AI to uh, produce uh, methods to check the safety of generative AI. So all this thinking process can be also assisted and augmented or even replaced by AI. I cannot think in all domains. I know very narrow scope of knowledge, so there are things I don't know, I can ask uh, my AI to help me think, right? So we feel threatened because we always thought that's what makes us humans unique, our language abilities, our ability to speak, our ability to um, emote, our ability to think. These seem to be all doable by machines. So what's our humanity? Mm. That's a challenge to us. I think we need to focus on our humanity, so our, the way we respect each other, the, the way we, we treat each other with uh, understanding, empathy between different cultures, to learn about each other, right? To understand the kind of questions we need to ask. What are the big questions we need to ask today? What are the big problems we need to solve? AI helps us solve problems. We ask the questions. We ask the important questions. Yesterday I learned this term Ubuntu from a uh, participant here from Africa, I love it. Mm. I am who you are, I am who everybody is. Mm. That's human, that's yes. not machines. Machines are not who we are, we are who we are. Thank you, uh, Pascal. Jeremy, are you worried? We have very little time. <laughs> <laughs> very little time. Um, I'm actually quite a bit more optimistic. Mm. I'm much more concerned around the immediate existential risks of geopolitics, mm. of climate change, yes. of misinformation, election, uh, than I am around necessarily killer robots. So I realize there's a few of them in the cars going around, <laughs> but uh, the way it's sometimes portrayed. But I still see more opportunities than not. I think I see far more green areas and the uh, generative AI can actually help raise the base level of capabilities for a number of uh, individuals, actually empower them, 
and then augment the capabilities of the strongest or you know, the uh, most thoughtful people to be more creative and more applied. So overall, I'm optimistic on this, but we still need some regulation and governance along the way. Missy, final thoughts on the gender and artificial I'm with Jeremy. I'm just going to go out there and say it. Uh, I do not think we are any closer to AGI today than we were six months ago, than we were a year ago. I think that we are, many people are going down the wrong path it's not happening. There's no intelligence in these systems. There are no sparks of intelligence in these systems. These are man-made, and they're going to. And now I'm not going to rule out that something big could happen in the next, you know. But I do not think that that I'm not worried at all. I sleep very well at night uh, because I know just how brittle these systems are, and and they are not performing like you really think they're performing. Yeah, yeah. But I will tell you, I really do worry about the lack of deconstructionist thinking by people and their desire to believe it's true. And because of the desire, people are going to go down a path to try to make this happen. And in the end, we're going to be left with a, a, some serious consequences. Some very powerful statements. I told you this is going to be both exciting and terrifying. Thank you very much uh, to our audience, to my guest, Mary Cummings, Pascal Fong, Jay Lee, and Jeremy Jurgens. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.